morning about prayer. Prayer. And I, please don't turn me off. This is going to be very important for you to listen to. If you'll turn with me, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 22. Luke, chapter 22. It is perhaps the most significant prayer that has ever been prayed. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And even in this moment in Gethsemane, as he anguishes with the cup of dregs of the wrath of God, at the same time, yet he's teaching. He's teaching you and I thousands of years later. Luke chapter 22, and I'll just read through it and then we'll, we'll pray. Beginning with verse 39, it says, And he came out, speaking of Jesus, and he came out and went as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that you recorded these, this important scenario for our benefit so we could understand the anguish, the travail that you anguished in the garden. That we might look forward, seeing the very importance of prayer in our own lives, in our own challenges. And as we stand before our own mountains. Now, Father, I ask you that you give me the ability to pour this out of my lips the way that you poured it into my heart. I ask you to anoint every ear here in the worship room, those watching by webcast, that they might hear with their ear and understand with their heart. And this might bring conviction upon our lives that we might grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of God. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I realize that we live in a time that most Christians don't really have a prayer life. I'm sure all of us pray from time to time, especially when we have problems. But a prayer life is a discipline of prayer. It's something that you do on a regular basis. It's part of the discipline of your Christian experience. And now when you first get saved, you don't automatically know how to pray just because you got saved. A prayer life is something that you cultivate over the years. You start wherever you start. In, in my case, I, I didn't grow up in church, and so when I got saved, I, I just started with hallelujah. That's all I had. That's all I knew. But as God began to meet me in my time of prayer, that prayer began to grow. And there was a time, as I'm sure many of you, it was a challenge for me to pray 15 minutes, a quality prayer for 15 minutes. That was a challenge. But you continue to cultivate that prayer. You continue to expand it and learn how to spend time alone with God in that prayer. And, and you, you keep growing. And I, I can remember a time that I would, I would look at the clock when I started praying because I wanted to make sure I wasn't cheating myself. And I'd pray 15 minutes, and I'd, I'd push, and I'd pray out 25 minutes, and finally at a point I got where I could have a good quality prayer for one hour. And then it exploded. I found that place in God that I would begin to pray two hours, three hours, eight hours every single day. I lie not. I know it sounds like a lot, but it was possible. I worked a full-time job, and I still prayed eight hours every day. Now, I didn't have much time for Sister Lincoln, <laughs> and that was a problem, and so you need to be, maybe that was a little extreme. <laughs> but the point that I wish to make is that a prayer life is something that you cultivate. Your prayer life right now is exactly where you want it to be because you have not pushed into it, perhaps not understanding the benefits of prayer. You, when you pray, you are talking to the master of the universe. <laughs> I mean, it's not like you got Joe Biden on the phone. It's not like you're talking to the Supreme Court. You are talking to the creator of all things. Everything was made by him. 
And so prayer is especially important in our times of challenges. Jesus knew what he was getting ready to go through. He very much knew my hour is drawing now near. The, the prince of this world cometh. He knew. And so he went to this specific place to begin to pray. It says in verse 39, he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And that little phrase, as he was wont, it means that it was his custom. It means that this is the place that he always came. It tells us that Jesus had a time and a place where he prayed. We know he had a time and a place, otherwise Judas Iscariot could not have known where to bring the, the, the guards to arrest him. It's because this was the place, the garden, where he prayed, and there was a time that he prayed. Every Christian should have a place and a time to pray. See, when your whole prayer life is consumed, like, you know, yeah, I pray when I walk from my car to my office, you know, I'm praying and talking to God. That, that's good. That's wonderful. And, you know, when I'm a, doing my daily chores around the house, I'm praying and I'm talking to God. There's nothing wrong with that. That's good. But you need a specific place and a specific time that you have dedicated that time to give all your attention to the Lord. Because prayer is not prayer until you talk to him and he begins to talk back to you. It's a two-way communication. And if you don't have focus, if you're doing this and doing that and doing something else, you, you don't have the focus, God can speak and it'll go right past your ear and you won't realize it. So Jesus had a time and a place as he was wont to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. Now, we as Christians, we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And as in that day, the disciples followed him, we should follow him in his example that he set for us. Again, he's coming up against the biggest trial of his public ministry, the cross. And many times you and I have trials. We have mountains that uh, we, we need to figure out how to move through certain scenarios, but we don't take it to God. We don't spend time in prayer. We might just say, Jesus, help me. And that's better than nothing, but you can get more help than Jesus helped me. You see, the, the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace and cry out for mercy and help in the time of need. But that doesn't mean walking from your car to your office. That means you find a place alone with God and you have a come to Jesus moment. And you feel the glory of heaven begin to fill your soul and you, his presence is there. And you can cry on God's shoulder and he'll meet that need. But this is a discipline that you have to develop in your life. How many know flesh will not let you pray? Flesh will not let you pray. You, you can be praying, and as soon as you begin to move into the spiritual realm, your brain will say, oh, you forgot to do such and such. It didn't remind you before you started praying. But flesh, the, the carnality of man is enmity against God. And so one of the things about prayer is whether it's at five minutes, 15 minutes, or two hours, sooner or later, you're going to run straight into your flesh. It's a reality. And when you do that, you have to have your mind made up. I'm going to walk him down. I'm going to walk him down. I'm not going to let him stop me. I am going to take victory over the flesh. It says his disciples followed him. And when he was at that place, he said unto them, pray <laughs> that you enter not into temptation. Now, he was talking, of course, to the 11 disciples that were there. Judas Iscariot was, wasn't even there. And that's important. Judas didn't even make it to the garden. I'm going to let that sink in. Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus Christ, he never even made it to the place of prayer. He had no regard for the time of prayer. And we know the Bible says Judas went to his own place. So it's important, Jesus says here to the 11 that were there, he said, pray. He's saying it to you and I too. Make sure that you're cultivating a prayer life. Yes, it's going to take spiritual energy. Yes, you are going to have to push in it. But once you have a, a disciplined prayer life, there's nothing like it. You can go through anything. You can go through anything. You see, over the years, pastoring, 
I've had a lot of weight put on me. You can never know the weight that's on a pastor unless you are a pastor. <laughs> and I can remember when I came off the corporate job and I, I stopped working in corporate America when we built the first worship room over there. And I dedicated each morning at 3 a.m. I would come to that little church over there and I'd spend two or three hours with God. Just walking in his presence, just talking. Tell him, God, I need help. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never been a pastor before. I need you to help me. There, there's problems. When we built this building, there's problems. God, I need help. I, I need you to help me, strengthen me. That was 27 years ago. This morning, I'm a little bit older, so I got up at 4 o'clock. <laughs> to spend that time alone with God is something you cultivate over the years. Had I not done it back then, I wouldn't be here right now. It's a discipline you build, and it's not hard now. It, it, it just, it's just part of life. It's just part of the way I live. I've done it for so many years. So a prayer life is something that you have to cultivate. And Jesus said to the 11 that were there, he said, pray, verse 41. And, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and, pray, and prayed. Now, again, what Jesus is doing here is an example to all of us. He had the 11 there. He said, pray. Then he left them and he isolated himself alone with God. See, I, I love corporate prayer. We come out here on Tuesday evenings uh, uh, and, and we pray. And there's another prayer meeting on Tuesdays. The brothers meet over there on Saturdays and, 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 and they pray. And corporate prayer is wonderful. I love it. But there's a time I need to find myself alone with God. There's a time I, I don't need anyone else, any other distractions. I need that time to focus in on him and to have my ear inclined for him to speak to me. Is it, corporate prayer, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a beautiful thing, a beautiful expression of our faith in God. But you need some time alone because it's only when you're alone that you're building your own discipline. It's only when you're alone that you're really building that relationship and that tenacity of prayer. You can get strength in prayer like you get nowhere else. Nowhere else. See, this is why so many times people, when we do pray, we're praying, God, move my mountain. Well, God, he don't move mountains. He will touch your life and teach you how to take that mountain. He will make you a Joshua and teach you how to walk up the side, one side of that mountain and down the other side of that mountain. But it takes time cultivating a prayer life that allows us to have faith in God's willingness, his faithfulness to meet the need. He was withdrawn from them, and there are times that we have to withdraw ourselves. Sister Lincoln don't even, when, at 4 o'clock when the alarm goes off, she don't, she don't, she don't even ask anymore, what, what's wrong, what's, what's happening? She already knows where I'm going. I'm coming to spend some time alone with God. Saints, is such an important, and as our society be, continues to crumble, as our lives, we begin to see things we've never seen before in this country, you're going to need to know how to reach out and grab a hold of Jesus Christ. You're going to have to know how to pray. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and he kneeled down and prayed. Now realize he did not begin praying until he isolated himself. Do you see that? He had all the disciples. He told them, you need to pray that you enter not into temptation. But he didn't start praying until he, until he moved away and found a place of isolation. Do you realize that when Jacob wrestled with God all night long, he was isolated. He told the rest of the caravan, go ahead, go on. He isolated himself with God, and he wrestled with God all night long. And God changed his name from Jacob, the surplanter, to Israel, prince with God. There's things that God wants to do in your life between you and him is personal. Yes, we are the body of Christ, but you're a unique individual Christian at the same time. And there's times that God has things for you and you alone. And you should have things that, oh God, I want to speak to you. I don't need everybody else listening to me. I need to speak out of my heart to you. I got some things I want to put before you. 
<laughs> he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down. Now, if you'll keep your finger there, Luke will come back to it. Let's go to Mark chapter 14. It's the exact same scenario, but the Holy Spirit through the apostle Mark gives us a little more detail uh, than we see of this Gethsemane experience. Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 33, it says, And he, Jesus, taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. So Mark explains that he left the, the 11, he told them, pray that you enter not into temptation. But then he took the, the inner circle, James and John and, and Mark, he, he took them a little bit closer. And he began to be sore amazed and very heavy. How many ever have a trial that just gets you heavy hearted? <laughs> the key to your the key to your victory is in the scripture. Now, Jesus always knew he was going to the cross. He always knew that this was a challenge. He had already ministered and told his disciples that he'd be crucified in Jerusalem. He knew this was going to happen. But the, the commentator sweet says this concerning the phrase, he began to be sore amazed. It means that his first feelings were one of terrified surprise. For as long as he had foreseen the passion, when it came clearly into view, its terrors exceeded his anticipation. His human soul received a new experience. It means the trial of Calvary was, it was a great challenge for Jesus Christ. Yes, he's God, but he's also 100% man. And something about all of us, we want to live. And we don't want nails in our hands. And we don't want a crown of thorns on our heads. He felt everything you and I would feel concerning the terrors of the cross. He began to be sore amazed and very heavy. But even in that moment of his greatest trial, sore amazed and very heavy, he's showing us the answer is prayer. The answer is prayer. He stayed right there under the load of this heaviness and he began to reach out to his father. And you and I have the exact same father. You and I have the exact same opportunity to reach out to God. Verse 35 says, and, and he said unto them, the inner circle, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here and watch. The word watch is fairly synonymous with pray. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground. Now notice, again, he separated the three from, from the others, from the other eight, I suppose it was, and they went a little further, but then he separated himself from the three. It's letting us know, you need a personal prayer life. Yep. You need a personal prayer life. See, I thank God through the years, we, as I've said, we've always had Tuesday night prayer for 27 years. Thank God for that. But there are times that Tuesday night prayer comes and nobody comes to prayer. I'm here because I do this for me. I, I need some help. Amen. I need some strength. And there comes a time you may not be able to reach me to pray for you. You may not be able to reach your prayer partner. You need to know God for yourself. You need to know that he hears your prayer. And you need to know that God will answer, not prayers generic, he'll answer your prayer. You have to cultivate that prayer relationship with him. It doesn't come automatic. If you're waiting on automatic, you'll never pray. Because you have all of the friction of the television set, the social media accounts, you've got your job, you've got your family. You've got to sleep six to eight to ten hours. <laughs> you've got a lot of other things going on in your life. Prayer is something you've got to push some stuff aside and say, right here, this is the place, this is the time. As a young Christian, I remember we were living in an apartment, and the back bedroom had a big walk-in closet. And Sister Lincoln and I, we cleared out that closet. Nothing was in it except a, bowl, a, a vial of holy oil, 
and a handkerchief that we had a prayer list written on and a pillow and a Bible. And we were going there whenever, and that's where we spent time with God. You need a place. You need a place. And you need a time. That, that means you're moving everything aside. This is it right here. There's only one thing that happens right here. And that's how you, that's how you begin to solidify a, a prayer life. That's how you begin to cultivate it. Where it's not something you can move around with your schedule. I'm preaching better than your amen. See, if, if our prayer life is, is dependent upon our schedule, well, forget it. You're never going to have a prayer life. Because your flesh will also always schedule something then. <laughs> but when you say the schedule, I don't care what's on it. This is my time with God. That's how you build that discipline. He said unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry you here and watch. And he went a little further. Saints, you can always go a little further. If your prayer is 15 minutes, you can go a little further. If it's an hour, you can go a little further. If it's three hours, that's, that's what you, you can always go a little further. And he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. Now, again, keep in focus. This is the greatest challenge of Jesus's incarnation, his public ministry, nothing has come against him like this. And when he, as, as the commentator said, when it came into full view, it caused the terror that went through his human soul. And it says here that um, he went a little further and he fell on the ground. Now, when you read the Greek commentator, Kenneth Wiest, uh, this is an imperfect verb, fell is an imperfect verb. It means that he fell and he kept on falling. It means that the, the weight of this, he would just collapse to the ground as he was crying out to God and he would get back up to pray and he'd fall again and fall again. It was, it was a, a punishing weight that was on him. And listen, there are times in you and our lives, it's not as bad as the cross, but we can have weights on us. We can have things that are emotionally uh, injuring us, that are financially injuring us. And if we would learn to take it to God in anguish in prayer. See, prayer is sometimes, it's, it can be an anguish. Oh, thank God when he pours his presence into your prayer, oh, it lifts every load, but you got to fight the battle to get there. And rather than fighting to scale up a mountain all by yourself, you can ask God, he'll give you strength to walk, walk right up. In fact, David said, I, I, he had so much strength, he said, I feel like I could run through a troop, and when I get through him, I could leap a wall. <laughs> <laughs> and he can give you and I the same kind of strength. You look at Moses. Moses was a man that tarried in God's sight. And Moses, oh, I can't remember how old he was, but the Bible said his eyes were not dimmed and his natural force was not abated. God can keep you. He can cause youth to stay in your body if you have a prayer life, if you spend time in his presence. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. He prayed, if it were possible, the hour might pass. Now, Luke 42 gives us the content of Jesus' prayer in this moment. I mean, the Holy Spirit is telling us this is exactly what he prayed. What a privilege. Verse 42, Jesus prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup. Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, we know that all things are possible to God. In the, first, in the previous verse, he said, if it be possible. Well, all, the Bible said all things are possible to God. He, he can do anything that he wants to do. But now Jesus prays, he says, uh, if thou be willing, if thou be willing, let this cup pass from me. Now, we know God didn't let the cup pass. That means God was not willing. Hear me today. God was not willing to do it any other way than the way that he had blueprinted over the past 4,000 years at the time. Now, here is, here is where prayer really happens. It's where you find, you press through the anguish, you come into his presence, and now, irrespective of what you think, you line your will up with his will. 
You don't ask him, God, do this, do that, do this. No, let me line up with you and I'm in perfect safety. And most of us, many of us, I should say it that way, we have things, but we want it done our way. God is immutable. He don't change. He knew the way that was going to play out from the foundation of the earth. He won't change it for you. I found this out as a young Christian. I, I, got, I had, a, I had a, a, a very strong conversion. I mean, I was radically saved, almost a Saul of Tarsus type experience. And having gone through that, I felt like I had a special relationship with God, and I did. It was mine. But I remember a challenge that came into my life, and I, I said, God, would you deal with this? Would you make this thing go away? And I found out God was not willing. I brought it on myself, to be honest. But he wouldn't fix it. <laughs> but he gave me the strength to walk through it. And that's what prayer is about. Prayer is not about you getting your way. Prayer is about you finding the will of God and receiving the strength to walk in it. There's going to be some difficult days in this nation. They're, they're, on, they're right, right at the door. And you and I are going to have to know how to get a hold of God. What would you do if your job told you Monday morning, we don't need you no more? What would you do? What, what would you do if you went, if you're in an apartment or you're paying on a house, they told you, hey, we, you can't buy this no more. We, we renege. <laughs> what, what would you do? See, each one of us have to know in a moment how to reach out and grab a hold of Jesus because you need an anchor for your soul. You need stability sometimes in the midst of the trial. And that's what a prayer life is all about. He prayed, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Now, even in Jesus, in, in terms of his human incarnation, his will was different than the will of the Father. Now, if Jesus' will can be different than the Father's will regarding the cross, what do you think about you and I? <laughs> Jesus said, not, not my will, your will. That means they're different. But he had the wisdom in prayer, as you and I should have, to realize what I want right now is not consistent with what you want, God. And so I'm praying that my will, don't give me what I want, Lord. I want what you want. I want you to put in my heart a love for what you want. He'll do it, saints. He will do it. When I had been praying for years, I had been praying probably for a decade. God, I want to come off the job. I just want to work for you. <laughs> and I went to, I was working at, at uh, what is that? I can't think of the name of it. It's an oil company on, on 35. Exxon, Exxon Mobil. I was making at the time $60 an hour. And this was, this, this was almost 30 years ago. Man, it, it was good money. Sister Lincoln and I, our money was so long, we was giving away money. And I was a contractor, so contracts end from time to time, and my contract ended unexpectedly, but that's just what it is to be a contractor. And I got in my car to drive home, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to have to turn off uh, some of the, the bells and whistles on our mobile sale plan because, you know, we had the fat plan. And I guess I'm going to have to get away, uh, get rid of the weekly maid that comes by. Sister Lincoln was working as well, so we had a lady that would help her clean the house. And uh, I'm driving up 35, and God spoke to my heart, and he said, don't turn off anything. Don't turn off anything. And I cried. I would get up in the mornings and God told me, I don't want you to interview. I don't want you to take a job. I don't want you to send out resumes. You will work for nobody but me from now on. And oh, that's what I always thought I wanted to hear <laughs> until I heard it. And I would sit in my office in my house and I'd watch Sister Lincoln go, go to work and I'd cry because I was scared. But my prayer was, God, I want your will. And if we end up under a bridge because I miss God, I'm going to have to take that chance because I'm going to find your will. Saints, every one of us, you need to come to a place in your life where you know him. 
where you know him. Put your life on the line. God, if this is not you, then this is why I end right here. But I'm going to find you. I'm going to find that relationship with you. I'm going to find a way to trust you when, when there's nothing left, when I don't see anything to trust in. I don't know. It's been 27 years. Cell phone bill has never been late. Now, we've changed it, of course, over the years because it's just wisdom. Never had a late house payment. Never had a late car payment. Never had anything late. God is able. He didn't move the mountain. That was scary because I know how to get a job. I mean, I'm, I, I just, I've always worked. I've always done it this way. You, you work this way. And that. But God has taken care of every need every day for 27 years. And, and I have lacked nothing. You have to learn how to press in and trust him. Not, not operating in your own will. If it was my will. I would have went and just got right back, got another contractor, called some headhunters, got another tr contractor. Yeah, I need $65 an hour now because that's how you move. And I would have just moved on. But to not do what I was comfortable with and to line myself up with the will of God. Saints, that's, that's what a prayer life is all about. I've got a rush here. Saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup. God was not willing. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. Once he lined up his will with the will of God, verse 43 says, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Your strength comes when you have lined your will up with the will of God and you are in prayerful connection with God to keep that your will in synchronization with his will. That's when the strength comes so that everything you touch works. So that everything you touch works. We had a, we had a church, our church, uh, we had, Sister Marilyn, you were there. We had, I don't know, but we might have had 20 people in that little church we was in. And then we moved to another storefront, and I think we might have had 30. And we put together a quarter million dollars to build. We put that, the, the, together the money to get the loan for a quarter million dollars to build the front of that church. And when other people that I came out of church with, when they were floundering, God just set us up. And within two years, we built the fellowship hall because we were growing so fast. But it didn't come because I'm so smart. I don't, I've never been to seminary. I, I, I don't even have a college education. I barely got out of high school. <laughs> but if you align your will up with God, <laughs> everything you touch, <laughs> God said, every place you put your foot, I'll bless it. <laughs> he said, hey, just put your foot there and I'll bless it. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he doesn't do it because you know that scripture. He does it because your will has been lined up with him. You see, even right now, somebody asked me the other day, man, you ready to build a Knock down that wall and go bigger? No, not at all. I'm not going to do it at all. <laughs> well, what if the place fills up? Well, we might have to go to three services. I don't know. But I will not touch that wall unless God makes me do it. He's got to speak to my heart because my ambition does not overrun me. The ambition burnt off a long time ago. <laughs> But, but the importance, what I'm trying to stress is get your will lined up with him. I, I don't care what's right or what's wrong. I just care about what does God want. I, I don't care about the political left or the political right. I don't care about that. God, what do you want of me? I'm your servant. Speak, master, and I will do it. <laughs> but but this at, the whole attitude, the whole mindset, it comes from years of cultivating a prayerful relationship with him. So here we have some options. You cannot come to the garden at all as Judas did, but it did not turn out well for him. You can come to the garden, but not move on to as the, as the inner circle did. Or you can even be part of the inner circle. But when Jesus was anguishing in prayer, they were asleep. They were asleep. Now, you want to know how to start a prayer life? Set your alarm clock an hour early. Ain't nothing happening. You ain't got nothing on your schedule an hour early. 
<laughs> I got not a amen. <laughs> None stopping you except that comforter. <laughs> because that's how I learned. I'd set my alarm clock. It says, I'm, I'm not making this up. It was hard at the beginning. I would set my alarm clock for 3 o'clock. Then I would set another alarm clock out in the, hall, in the hallway for 3.15. So if I didn't get up on this one, now I got to get up out of bed and go get that one. But I learned how to do it. Now I don't, e I don't even need an alarm clock. 4 o'clock comes, my eyes open. I'm ready. It's time. But it comes over years of disciplining yourself. You, you can do it. Just because it's hard, you can't do it. Young people, young people hear me because you got more time. Start your prayer life now. Cultivate it and, and grow it. Just like you would grow a, a, a garden. Cultivate it, sow the seeds of prayer, cultivate it, and grow your prayer life. And as you get older, you'll find out you have power with God because you have relationship with him. And then finally, the last option is you can go a little further. And you can line up your will with God's will, and you can receive the strength. He won't move your mountain. You might run from it in your flesh. You might just run from it. <laughs> but God doesn't move mountains. He gives his people victory over the mountains. He gives his people strength to walk past, to walk through the mountains. So I'll close with this last thought. You don't have to turn here, but it's Luke 18 and 1. Jesus spake a parable. To this end, that men ought to always pray and not faint. Faint means to lose your strength, means to backslide in your heart. Grow your prayer. Cultivate your prayer. Because that's where the victory is. Would you bow your heads, please, all over the room. Father, I've done my best this morning to share that that you've given me. Father, prayer is hard for us. You experience what we experienced in your public incarnation. I would ask you right now, Lord, that every person that has a receiving heart this morning in this room that's watching over the online experience, God, that you would help us bring the conviction of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts and help us to learn to begin to wrestle with prayer, to begin to anguish, to cultivate, to build our prayer life. God, help us. You've, you've given us so much. God, give us this that we might grow in our ability to pray, in our ability to find ourselves alone with you and to remain in that secret place. Father, we're asking it in Jesus' name. All over the room, why don't you just lift your hands to heaven and just ask the Lord, Father, help me today. Help me today. Prayer's hard for me. It's not easy. And God, I, I thank you that I pray, but God, I ask you to give me a greater prayer life. Help me to come to that place that I have. I find strength in you. Come on, just reach out. Just reach out to the Lord this morning. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you that you would hear our prayers. In those areas where we should have been praying, Lord, forgive us and help us to correct our, our, our prayer life and get back into spending time with you the master of the universe, the great one. We thank you for the privilege of entering into your presence by the blood of the most holy Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We bless you, we praise you, Lord God. Help us in Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. That's, that's something we all need to grow in our prayer life, intimacy with God. But before you go, just want to make a few quick announcements. If you haven't given, uh, you can do so now. Just a reminder, you can text to give. There's all kinds of ways to give on the screen. We do need your support. Um, another thing, photos. We did, you know, the photos uh, a little while ago. Now, we would have sent you an email, and from that email, you're to reply and tell us which photo you want. And um, if you didn't get the email, that means we don't have your email. So see me after service. I'll be in the lobby. Um, and so you can also email media at christunveiled.org, but you have to select your photo by today. Today's the cutoff. Select which photo you want. You can get an 8x10 or a 5x7, or two 5x7s, I'm sorry. 
Also, for anybody that's a speaker in laity, you know who you are if you're a laity to laity speaker, we have a mandatory meeting coming up Wednesday, October 26th at 7 p.m. And so um, that's where, you know, Pastor and I will do some ministering and, and share some of our knowledge and experience to help you uh, further your laity ministry. All right. With that, we want to let you know God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.